Well, uh, Phil Jackson, on behalf of uh, Jerry and all the coaches attending the Way of Champions Conference here in 2023, we're so, so honored that you've taken the time to be on and, and share some of your insights and uh, thoughts. And after so many years in the game as an athlete and, and a coach and an executive, uh, we truly, truly appreciate you taking the time out of a beautiful Montana summer to be here with us. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to let Jerry start here because he wanted to tell the story how you guys first met. So, Jerry, why don't you dive in and tell that story? Well, I want to, but, uh, you know, Phil, you got to correct me if I'm wrong because my memory of it is fading. But I remember there was a woman. She was the editor-in-chief at Bantam. Her name was Leslie Meredith. Does that ring a bell? That's right. Yeah, right. Okay, so I'm on track. So I'll proceed with the story. So I guess uh, she was she was looking to, uh, to get you to write a book with Bantam. And uh, she was ahead of a time, believe me, she took my book thinking body dancing mind, when 18 or 20 publishers refused it for publication. So she was a visionary and, and she saw you as a, a possible candidate to write a beautiful book as well. And uh, so she sent you a copy of Thinking Body, Dancing Mind, and then you proceeded, as you normally have done, to, uh, to make your athletes better people, better athletes, better whatever. Uh, you gave a copy, I believe, to Michael Jordan. Uh, my co-author, Al Wong, was up in Bandon Dunes Golf Course, and uh, when, uh, when Michael met him, he says, Oh, I have a copy of your book. I love it. Will you sign it? You know, uh, and I and I know you gave one to Steve because Steve and I developed a friendship out of that uh, act of of giving him the book. And to this day, Steve and I remain friends, and we're he's reading all my stuff and supporting it and what have you. I'm just curious. Uh, so that's the story. But and I'm grateful. I'm so grateful that happened and for your support over the years and your belief in the work of Way of Champions and Dow Sports. I'm just wondering, I'm just curious what it is about the stuff that I particularly do, like the thinking body, dancing mind theme uh, that attracted you to that, that, that gave you a sense that, yes, I could support this kind of work and I can get behind it. What was it? You know, I think it was an introduction in the late 60s uh, to alternative thinking and, you know, having been a religion, psychology, philosophy major minor at college, that I had explored a variety of different thoughts and uh, ideas. Those three disciplines all merged together into... Eastern thought, which is kind of what the fascinating was for me at that time. I graduated from college in 67, and it was a fruitful time for alternative uh, thinking and variety of things that were happening, yoga, tai chi, you know, various martial arts that were blossoming. And, uh, you know, I participate in some of those uh, ideas, Tai Chi and yoga, particularly as an athlete, it felt that the body resounded to a certain discipline and a certain mindset in a way which could enhance excellence or best behavior, best you know, use of the body um, and having been an athlete and exploring, you know, 82 games a season, um, variety of moods going into games and how you mentally prepare for games. Um, it became kind of a, an idea or a passion of mine. And I was in graduate school in between my first two years as an NBA player. See, and I made a, uh, a whopping twelve point five thousand and fifteen thousand dollars my first two years in the NBA. I thought I probably should prepare for a profession after this career of basketball if I could make it. So I was in psychology at graduate school, and uh, 
you know, doing things with group therapy, which is re <clears throat> really big at the time. Ellis and Maslow were, you know, two right, premier right, thinkings right. about self-realization <laughs> and <clears throat> particularly about uh, transformative leadership. Mm. So it always became kind of like an idea or a passion of mine to watch and adhere to how this went along. And then <clears throat> following a, my second year in the NBA, I went through a uh, spinal fusion and sidelined me for a year uh, plus, and I got to be, uh, you know, next to the coach. He had no assistance. And uh, I was in the locker room with him when the team went out to the floor. Red, Red Holzman. Yeah, Red Holzman, yeah. Hall Red of Fame Holtzman. coach. Yeah. Who was a thinking man. And he yeah. always was like the middle road, Phil. The middle road, not too high, not too low. Well, that's the Buddhist you know, concept, right? right. So he, he was uh, a real good mentor to me when I later became a coach myself. Yeah, and also the lesson of impermanence too. Yeah, for nothing, sure. Nothing lasts. Mm. It all it, it all fades. It it takes a lot of courage to sort of be ahead of your time, though, doesn't and it, doesn't it? Like, and as a player at that time, to be thinking about yoga and meditation or any of this Eastern thought, and then I think also you know, when you became a coach to, to introduce some of these things to your locker room at a time when no one was, was doing it. Um, and, and maybe some of those things were seen as, well, you know, a sign of weakness, right? You don't do psychology unless you're sick, right? What, what, what was it like? What gave you the, the, the courage and the assuredness to say, no, this, this, this stuff works. This is a, this is a competitive advantage. I wasn't sure it was kind of a new venture to go out and do this type of thing. Uh, one thing that is a story that might, you know, be an interesting story. The year that Michael Jordan retired in 93, four, 90 after the, yeah, he was out for the 93, 94, 94, 95 seasons. And the, his decision was in September after his father had been murdered that summer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had a ceremony in, you know, in the United Center for Michael Jordan. It was like fans came out, coaches were there, the you know, Olympic coaches were there, his college coach was there, Dean Smith, Bobby Knight. They were sitting right behind me. We were like on the podium, et cetera. They're sitting behind me before the program started. They, they kind of leaned forward. They said, tap me on the shore. Phil, Phil, what's that? Is it true that you sit in darkness and hold hands with the players before games? Yeah. Wow. I said, well, that's kind of the idea, but we don't hold hands. We're, we're not holding hands, but we do sit and get focused on what we're trying to get accomplished. And uh, we clear our minds. And then the program started. It, it never went any farther than that with those two. But that was kind of the concept or idea. What's going on? Um, and, uh, you know, I solicited uh, Jonathan Cabot Zinn, who was teaching mindfulness at that time, to uh, send me someone that could be a uh, meditation leader in 94, 95. And uh, you said a guy named George Mumford, who has created his own kind of school of thought and his own program with athletes and just helping people be their better self uh, over the years. And George would come out and spend some time with us in training camp. Um, and so when Michael Jordan came back, you know, we were starting to kind of get in stride. I had built a room that was kind of cohesive to that thought when we moved into a new workout facility in Chicago, Deerfield actually. And it had, you know, various things that were conducive to the, the idea of we will sit and we'll 
kind of get focused here as a group. And, uh, you know, then I started using the idea one mind, one breath, one breath, one mind mm -hmm. as a concept. Mm -hmm. And George mummified you guys. Is that correct? Is that what he did? <laughs> yeah, the uh, <laughs> T-shirt came out uh, with the guys all sleeping, dozing, disease <laughs> coming out of their mouths in a bubble. <laughs> and, you know, mummified or being mumford, uh, mumford was kind of the idea. Yeah. I used to say, it's all right. You fall asleep. It's okay. You're still in it. You're still yeah. with us. Yeah. <laughs> You're not thinking of something else at that moment. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it, but it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. Just like the story you share about, right? Preeminent coaches going, what's the hocus pocus you got going there, right? And and now obviously much more accepted, much more understood, I think. Um, but then it, it it took courage and and it was like, well, they're winning championships. So it must be something about this right but yet it's not like it's not like everyone then jumped in and did it either right no to you know to courage and people you know are now you know obviously you'll have professional people that can work with mind the one of the things that's interesting that you may remember was paul westhead came in to coach chicago for a brief year maybe in 85, 84. Mm -hmm. And he, he was a believer in crystal power. Mm. Remember when people used to meditate under crystals? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And he tried to get guys to, you know, join in on that. And that was a little bit too bizarre for the players at that time. I mean, they could, they could deal with, you know, mindfulness, uh, if they were led in a meditation, you know, kind of leading them into, you know, getting in, in touch with your body and your breath and, you know, quieting the mind and settling in and doing that type of stuff. But I think the crystal power was a little bit beyond what they could yeah. attach to. It was yeah. a, a kumbaya moment that a lot of people <laughs> weren't ready to jump on. And, and, uh, I struggle with this myself, actually, Phil. You can imagine, uh, you know, being refused for publication because I had this concept of creating a marriage between Taoist thought and and Western psychology. Uh, the people back in Penn State who were my mentors thought I was absolutely certifiably crazy. And uh, but I knew, as you did, I would imagine intuitively that this is something that's really needed this whole idea of mindfulness. And uh, I just finished writing a book called the, uh, which you have a copy of and which you endorse, which is the mindful coach. And uh, it now it's becoming almost a household word. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have this conversation with Phil Jackson if, if, if we didn't talk about mindfulness. And I'm just wondering if we take a, another step deeper into that, you know, what does that mean to you? so we can help other coaches understand it because there are there is still i can tell you from my experience there's a lot of doubters out there but a lot of people are buying in and i'm just wondering how much they can benefit from hearing you talk a little bit more about what that means and uh, why do our coaches even need to consider that concept of being a mindful coach you know in these days and age you know well i think that we're overwhelmed obviously with our you know, internet activity. And, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that the detrimental aspect of what's happened to education and children that are, you know, getting, uh, you know, disruptive thoughts, uh, boys that are attached to video games, pornography, et cetera, that can't get the thoughts completely out of their head are examples of what happens when the mind is, um, you know, act, wants to be active and wants to be, take control. And the ego is very dominant yeah. and the mind's very attached to being attended to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a background note that you may enjoy or may not. Both my parents were ministers, Assemblies of God. That's a Pentecostal faith. And they were deep spiritual believers. We were dedicated to the service of God as children yeah. in front of our congregation. 
we were baptized after we were confirmed at age 13. It was an immersion type of a baptism. It was, it was a very active and uh, engaged religion. And as a child of a minister, you get to see the inside of well, what goes on inside yeah. of the parish, inside the congregation, inside the, the dedication that your parents have to take. And my mom, who was uh, an indoor, uh, ordained minister, used to do the wifely chores of, you know, um, usually she would say as maybe 30 shirts a week she'd have to iron and and uh, Monday was you know wash day and Tuesday was ironing and Wednesday was ironing all these shirts as my dad would you know do maybe two shirts a day and go to a you know hospital and visit people and, uh, in age homes and related situations that took him into the public area and then having a you know an evening service or you know maybe four days four nights a week um so it was she was a a woman that had to do menial tasks and you know you know how that was back in the 50s there you know even even the idea of you know easy access to you know a dryer or things like that you had a the you know, mangle iron that you might use to get the sheets ironed. But um, she had a recording of the whole Bible on records. It was on 16 and whatever, you know, 30, 33 and a third is as low as years ago, right on a photograph. Yeah. yeah. This was at 16 something, one eighth or whatever. And um, she listened to the Bible as she ironed those shirts, which took her many hours in the course of a week to keep up with the shirts and the menial tasks that she had. And I always wondered what's going on here. And she always would say, well, you know, the idle mind is a devil's playground. <laughs> you know, that's where thoughts come in and that's where thoughts intrude. And so we, we wow. had this image in front of us of, you know, the mind and the control the mind has. As you grow into, you know, meditation, you understand that mind controls are extremely effective on the body. But the key is breath controls mind, mind controls body. So the breath becomes the important thing to learn as you grow into this spiritual life. And that's what inspiration is all about. It's about inspiring, about breathing and following your breath and being part of it. So um, that introduction into uh, the advantages of having a mind that was uncluttered was, you know, something that I learned as a child kind of to avoid actually not to get too carried away with this obsessiveness about keeping correct thoughts, biblical thoughts. Um, but just to have the ability to clear the mind and to reset, it, be purposeful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what's scary, Phil, I just came across this statistic about, Generation Z kids, you were mentioning some of the stuff. And <clears throat> there was this one study that said 79% of kids experience some level of anxiety when they're away from their device, right? 79%. Wow. I mean, four out of five are at basketball practice feeling anxious because they're not connected <laughs> <laughs> to what's going on. And, and that's just such a scary thing, you know, not the way you grew up or I grew up or Jerry grew up of just being present in the moment with your friends doing stuff like now it's like you're at practice and you're thinking I'd rather be there, right? I'd rather be on TikTok or something like that. It's kind of scary, isn't it? It's a companion and we have even greater forces ahead of us in AI because mm -hmm. AI will be your friend. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. right now the phone's basically your friend. It'll put things in front of you that you choose to look at or 
to observe. But I think the AI is going to be, you know, really your friend and you're going to uh, see the advantages that uh, or disadvantages that that brings to our society on top of it. So yeah, there's a really a special need for the understanding of, of the mind and what, how we can use it. Yeah, I, I was speaking recently to a friend about, you know, meditation. And the Buddha knew the 28 sequences of the mind before he went into this enlightened state. As the mind is, is just like a computer. It's a computer that keeps regurgitating things and replaying things to us and playing on our anxieties and our fears. And, uh, you know, the ego wants to be, you know, prominent in, in choosing that. And as we grow into this spiritual life or adapt it, we understand that there are certain things that trigger. And, you know, we, we've got to eliminate them or brace them, the ones that do. Mm. You know, I have Jerry, I know before we switch gears, it's, you know, I wrote down, Phil, a, a quote of yours here about leadership and you wrote, it's a mysterious juggling act that requires not only thorough knowledge of the time honored laws of the game, but also an open heart, a clear mind and a deep curiosity about the ways of the human spirit. And I think that's really come across with you already here in just a couple of minutes that you've always had this deep curiosity. And for all the coaches who are at this conference um, or watching via the live stream or whatever, um, I think one of the biggest problems in coaching and leadership is that Th this, what we're talking about here isn't taught, right? It's the X's and O's. I want to become a better basketball coach. Well, what offense am I going to run? Phil, you know, the triangle offense, I'm going to run this defense. I'm going to do that. But, but I think it should be clear to everyone right here that coaching is about getting in touch with the human spirit of each individual in front of you and, and, and serving their needs. Um, you see this gap as as well, and any advice for our coaches here at this conference of how they can be better at that? I have a colleague, a basketball coach named Ron Ecker, A K K E R, and he's written in a number of books, mostly features on statistical stuff. But he's uh, a man that uh, was a curiosity person and has very many great stories to tell. And a lot of it has to do with the art of um, archery, the, the Zen book that was prominent in his life that kind of brought him around to the idea of, of mind and setting it in. And his idea of teaching coaches is that you have to be in touch with yourself. You have mm -hmm. to be, you know, you can't be harried, temperamental, you have to be calm and you have to be receptive because that's really what your position is to be, you know, really receptive to the mood of the team, what needs to be done as a, as a leader and how to develop players or how to touch them in a way that they could perform best. And to do that, you have to really sit back and be receptive. And, you know, that's the transformative end of it. The transactional coaching is the one that's, driving, driving, pushing, you know, my way or the highway type of thing, which can be very successful. Mm -hmm. Coaches have had great success using that transactional attitude. And that's a militaristic attitude, one which I was brought up with. I was, you know, one of my coaches in, in uh, high school was at Iwo Jima uh, Marine. And it, it was very much about, um, your direct action that resulted from following commands. And uh, so, you know, we grew up with that kind of attitude, especially in coaching, which was took on a militaristic attitude or kind of a way, but there's another way of doing it. And I'm happy that, you know, we were able to find a way to do it. I had another coach, both of my coaches in high school, their names were Peterson, Bob and, you know, Harold. And Bob Peterson was totally the other side of the coin. He was uh, the basketball coach and he was about, you know, uh, being a, you know, member of the uh, 
Presbyterian, the uh, elder in his church, a Kiwanis Club member who was a service person in the community, didn't allow swearing in the, in the locker room and, you know, a very upright kind of guy, but also <laughs> understood human characteristics. And so I, I kind of had the both ends of the sides of the coin in my um, high school, you know, mm -hmm. athletic experience. And it was beneficial. Both of them were beneficial, but I chose the other way. I chose the way of, uh, you know, a transformational coaching mm -hmm. or yeah. something that I think Maslow and Ellis kind of yeah. promoted his psychology back in the sixties. Yeah. Plus you had uh, Red Holzman, which in yes. my memory of, being a New Yorker, going to Madison Square Garden and watching him as a coach, uh, he had to have some influence along that line to give you the confidence to maybe follow some of that, what you're talking about. Yes, tremendous influence with uh, Red Holzman. Uh, you know, and it was, you know, the middle path. He, he was, uh, you know, if there's something on the line, he used to say, you know, step into my bathroom, step into my office, it's the bathroom. The locker rooms are very small. The only private place you had was probably right next to the bathroom. And, you know, I, I didn't like the comments you made in the paper, you know, but that was, you know, that was about, you know, presenting a team unity and uh, format that he was very concerned about, but his ability and agility in coaching was remarkable. Um, you know, he, he was very much a guy that understood how people ticked, how they, how they worked through their, his, one of his traits that I kind of mentioned once in a while is that we would be flying into another city and it would be, you know, as opposed to present day, it would be an early morning flight. It would be getting into a hotel afternoon and should we go work out or not work out? And, He'd wander up through the aisles of the airplane. They were flying first class at that time, a big step in the late 60s. And he'd say, what do you think, guys? Should we go work out when we get in? Many times he did this. And, uh, you know, I, I was close to him. I sat across from him in that section of the plane. And finally, one day I said, why do you ask the players if they think it's a good idea to Oh, he said, I'm just judging one player. DeBusher says we should work out. That means, no, we should not work out. If he said, no, we better not work out. It means probably he had a couple of beers too many last night <laughs> and he probably should work out. So he took the alternative path, but it was like a jujitsu very much to me. So he brought in a lot of psychology in his life and in, yeah. in his, his coaching and yeah, getting to know the human being the relationship, getting to know somebody and how important that is uh, to your coaching, which so many people don't do, right? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, basketball is a very open sport. I mean, it's so, you know, you're so familiar with uh, the expressions, the attitude, the carriage of players. You could just read characteristics and in, in, into people pretty easily because you're out there in your, you know, your underwear, basically play at the game. Yeah. yeah. Um, you have, you have, uh, you have a, a, another quote that Jerry and I came across here, um, which I think is interesting at this point, because as a coach, right, you're, you're given this power, right. To like, like your coach did to come through. He, he didn't have to ask anyone whether we're going to practice or not, but he's giving people an opportunity to weigh in a little bit, but uh, you know, you, you said after years of experimenting, I discovered that the more I tried to exert power directly, the less powerful I became. I learned to dial back my ego and distribute power as widely as possible without surrendering final authority. I think that is one of the most powerful things a coach can do, that you don't surrender, surrender the final decision, but you put aside your ego and you give other people a, a say, especially working at the level you did with people like a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant or a Shaq, like, you, you know, they're not little children. Yeah. I, I think, I think that was quite evident to me when, you know, I became the, a veteran and one of the guys that was, you know, 
a long time standing. I mean, there was, you know, a few of us from our class that played a long time at the NBA and, you know, for six or seven years, you know, kind of a known entity. And they would, they would, I would be asked, you know, what do you feel about this player? How do you feel about a player on another team? Would you think that he would fit into this group that we have here? Um, it's not, um, in our case, New York's not easy to play. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody can play in New York City. It's not an easy place to, to live in. It's not an easy place to play. There's a lot of pressure on players. And you know, being flattered to be, you know, as not a superstar, not a star, and, you know, really only started about 100 games in an 800 career year or 800 game career. <clears throat> I was really a bench player more, more than anything else. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, I learned that dealing certain decisions to players gives them authority that gives them leadership qualities. And the best thing about a coach is when his leaders, players on the team, want to step into the leadership role and are willing to do the heavy lifting. Let's go do this work. Let's go practice. Let's enjoy this. Um, I want to compete in practice. We want to compete, uh, not maybe to the level of a game, but as close as we can come to that so that we're honing our skills to the best of our, our ability. So yeah, that was, that was one of the things that we really worked at as, as coaching staff is to get the players to buy into, buy into the work. Yeah. So they enjoyed the work. Um, I was, I was thinking of a example that, you know, used to be, um, kind of carried around the Bulls organization is that you really, <clears throat> you really, <clears throat> excuse me, you really had to have a special backup guard that was willing to guard Michael Jordan every day in practice <laughs> because it would players could wilt or could fall or lose confidence in their abilities to guard him. So many times I would split up the team so that the first unit was maybe playing with three guys and the second unit was playing with the other two starters and definitely have Scotty Pippen guarding Michael Jordan so that the top two competitive guys on our team would face each other and make this practice higher quality. Mm -hmm. And our belief was, as you play, as you practice mm -hmm. in this day and age, that's a lost term. People don't practice with that kind of fervor anymore. Um, and it, it was just embedded in us that we practiced as hard as we could. Now there's a whole different, generation of players in this last, you know, 20 years. And we've had to dial it back. And in fact, when Kobe was reaching, you know, maybe 200,000 minutes, I had a conversation with him and said, you know, now it's time to, you know, take the competitiveness out of your practice. I want you to do the work you do, tone your game up, but the limited practices are when you have two days between games because we need to protect the legs that you're you're going to run out of here very soon. Of course, he had Achilles injury, you know, I think in his 17th season as a, as a player, which goes to show, you know, that we are vulnerable as players and there is a need to take care of that physical talent that you have. But the confidence that we have between one another, especially with a kid like... Uh, Kobe Bryant, who was antagonistic after his uh, dealing with the uh, civil situation and the criminal situation that he faced from Colorado, um, made him very hard and tense and hard to work with. And the complete change in the next three or four years 
of his ability to be coached, his ability to, to become the leader was probably one of the great joys of my coaching career is to watch that transformation that happened with Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. Jerry? Yeah, boy, I remember that period, Phil. I remember that Kobe was uh, <clears throat> helped by you to, uh, to make his teammates better and to focus more on how can he serve, how can he give to his team so that they become better versions of themselves. I remember the transformation of seeing Kobe being, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I might be speaking out of school here, but it seemed to me like he had a bit of selfishness that didn't help develop the entire team. But you introduced him to some concepts and you made some points about how he could improve himself by improving the team. And then all of a sudden, it was like Kobe was now this amazing leader. You could see him going over to the younger guy, putting his arm around him. Uh, and, and, you know, is this somewhat accurate or... Yeah, it's very accurate. We, we, we had a, um, a meeting on the minds and, and, you know, I used to give him leadership books and the Tao of leadership is one of the books I gave him, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and there, there's, I think there's one about the leadership of winning the Pooh, something, mm -hmm. another one that's kind of humorous. The, the Tao of Pooh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I gave out books to players. But specifically to him, I, I wanted him to focus on the other. Uh, he wanted to be the greatest. And, you know, the first year I was there, uh, I got a call from Jerry West. And he was like, uh, you know, I got a call from Kobe this week. It's kind of concerning to me. But he said, how did you and Elgin Baylor both average 30 points a game on the same team? And he saw Shaq was averaging 28 a game and he was averaging 18. It's a big difference. And I, I saw that, uh, you know, that was going to be really one of his priorities. One of the focuses on, on his life is to score and to be known as one of the greatest players that ever played the game. That was his goal, an individual goal. And, um, uh, so we had many conversations before my first term with the Lakers was over and I came back for a second go round with them in 2004, five, which, you know, changed dramatically our, our time. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I told them basically that the joy of the game is about the championship. Mm. That's the culmination of our, our group effort. And it's just a fleeting moment. And we had this, this one statement that we used to say to the players following the games, playoffs, seasons that were successful is that you're only a success at the moment you've completed a successful act. Mm -hmm. At that moment, you're a success. Not the next moment, not the moments following. At that particular moment, that's your moment of success. And you can feel it. And so, you know, if anything else transpires, you know, you may win a scoring title. Your team may not do well, but you've won a scoring title. That's not, there's, there's a limited amount of success. It's when your team finally becomes a champion and you have that moment when you're exuberant about that moment of success that you've done it together. Mm -hmm. Phil, you know, I mean, we all know how many championships you have won or have been part of in your life as a player, as a coach. But in order to, in order to win those championships, it, it, you have to have a strong foundation uh, of love, connection, caring. Uh, I remember asking Steve, uh, somewhat recently, the, the first championship he won uh, with the Warriors. I said, what was the most important game you ever won? I was kind of baiting him, but I, I, I knew the answer. And, and sure enough, he hit it spot on. He said, the most important game we won that year was the relationship game. 
and when I when I listen to you talk about these experiences and so grateful that I can hear it firsthand from you rather than reading it someplace if I ever did read it what is it that you did as a person I mean what did, how did you achieve success with the relationship game there's so many coaches out there they want to know if it's so important to win the relationship game to win a championship or just to have a great successful team how do I start going about that I mean it seems like a challenge because I don't even know all the X's and O's, you know, I want to know how the triangle works, you know, but here you're talking about connecting with a Kobe Bryant, which probably on any other team would have had his way. Uh, but you offered him an opportunity to, to open up to his real true greatness, which he did, but that only comes from the trust and the closeness and the relationship game being won by you, the coach. What can you what can you tell us about that? When he- I think you have to be true to yourself. I think that's the key about coaching. And when wrong, you get your own life in order. That you know you cannot fake glad handing if that's not who you are. I'm not a glad hander, for example. I'm not a hugger. I like to shake somebody's hand and look them in the eye, which you don't do when you hug, right? (laughs) Um, You know, the real idea of, you know, something that's given and shared um, is something that's very personal usually. One of the ways that I personalized my relationship with players was to give them books that kind of met their, their mindset. You know, it was like, you know, uh, Dennis Rodman, I gave him a book on motorcycles. You know, (laughs) he wasn't going to read a book. He's not going to spend time mulling over words, but he's going to look at pictures of motorcycles and, and, you know, enjoy that particular aspect. And that, that type of thing of thinking about who, uh, who is this person? And I, I found that, you know, when I tiptoed around spiritual, stuff that it was my own my own inconsistency my own inferiority about you know the spiritual aspect of my own life which it was like you know 80 percent of my childhood growing up was the church the you know being a preacher's kid you know following the rules doing all this stuff you know so i was like you know limiting myself about but people really want to deal with the spirit, the act, act of the spirit. So I would throw in these little caveats about, you know, um, we're going to conspire now. Do you know what conspire means? The actual Latin word conspire with breath. Now it's taking yeah. on a real negative term because you know criminals conspire together to do evil things yeah but, conspiracy theories right yeah yeah but we're we're actually going to sit down here and talk about how we're going to treat this team that we're going up against the idea when i came to the bulls for example was that they were confronted by this bad boys the bad boys of detroit and one of my first experiences on the bench. Uh, Doug Collins, the head coach, coach, got thrown over the desk, literally picked up and thrown over the desk by Mayhorn of Detroit. And Johnny Bach went out to, you know, stop the fight and ended up spraining his wrist in his hand. And my concept to them was, every time you go up against Detroit, you want to retaliate. You can't retaliate. These guys... They're, they're bigger, stronger, more effective at retaliation. That's their game. They want to goad you into retaliating. But you can use this mental idea that these Native Americans had, that I, I'm a member of this tribe in Pine Ridge, and their idea is if we didn't have the crow to be warriors and to fight against, 
we wouldn't be the men we are. It gives us a challenge, and this is our challenge, is to meet this team with the character that will be dominating. And it's not going to be retaliatory. It's going to be the ability to turn it like Tai Chi, like uh, a martial art, and use what we can use against the force that's against us. And so it's not force against force anymore. It's force against mind. It's force against method. And this is how we're going to do it. And when you teach that type of attitude and players find success in it, they gravitate towards it. And particularly the spiritual aspect of this we need this because Jordan rules Michael getting you know 30 shots 35 40 shots a game was not going to beat the Bulls I mean not going to beat the Pistons it was going to be all the other contributors that were going to do it and Michael is going to be their focus and their decoy is going to ruin their game we're going to over overcome them by beating them with Michael and everybody else stepping into the vacuum Mm. So it became kind of a Tai Chi aspect of, uh, you know, uh, using someone's weight against themselves or someone's Force. prowess or aggressiveness. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, kind of like the idea that um, gives a, a coach the ability to lead uh, through a passive approach um yeah. you know uh i think that there's you know room f- there's a certain amount of aggression that you use in a, a warrior's nature that's part of being a warrior and as a spiritual warrior you know you you have to use that aggressiveness to your advantage and it doesn't have to become force it can become stealth Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, uh, you know, the, the Buddhists talk about and the Taoists talk about how soft is strong. Yes. And how how less is more. And basically how our opponent is our partner. And you're pointing that out brilliantly, yeah. how Detroit was our partner in making the bulls stronger as men coming together as warriors, as, as you so aptly use, exerting less power to gain power and and so many of us have a hard time with that because in our culture you know we're afraid there's a lot of fear giving up power and and so many coaches come from a place the transactional coach comes from a place of i'm afraid of giving up power and uh, i'll lose power i won't be able to coach but the irony of the whole thing and what you're saying is again you know less power don't go for more power, go, go for less power and, and see what happens. And, you know, like I remember the, uh, the analogy of, of the Buddha saying, if, if you want to control the cows, really control them, then move the fences back, <laughs> right? Like give them more space, you know, give Detroit more space, let them do their thing. This is what we're going to do. And it's that kind of Tai Chi balance of yin and yang and, you know, watching the movement. Yeah. And that's what's so I've beautiful. Used that. Go yeah. ahead. Thanks. I've used that illustration for meditation, that the more tightly you try to meditate and control your thoughts, the more difficult it is. You have to just give your mind a wide pasture to go out and graze. <laughs> and pretty soon it'll just, the waves will start to re- decrease and the mind will start to be flat. Growing Wave. up, in, growing mm-hmm. up in, in South Dakota, you had a lot of wild, wide mm-hmm. past uh, places to wander. And uh, <laughs> so you have an advantage. Uh, I, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, didn't have much space. <laughs> so uh, I kind of have a Brooklyn Dow in me. <laughs> oh, Phil, my. Phil. Can you give a, like a specific example or of the moments where, because I don't think you can convince a Michael Jordan to not score 40 points or a Kobe, like 
How, how do you walk an athlete through that journey of giving up the me for the we? Um, and any specific moments that you can think of or story that our coaches hear, because the, it doesn't matter what level you coach, you always have that athlete that has been taught or told it's only working if you score 30, right? And then, you know, to give up, you know, my points to win this game, how, how do you, how do you walk through that? And is it really just starts with building that relationship of trust so that they know, you know, Phil's in it for me. Um, and he sees, he sees that this is what the best thing for me is, is to give up a little bit of the me. Um, any specific stories around that? Because I think this is the art of coaching, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, I think there's a, a you know, amount of, of uh, conversation or cajoling or salesmanship or whatever you want to call it, not arm twisting, but a salesmanship of what really is the concept of team and teamwork or team and ship or, you know, being a good teammate. And um, when I was given the job as the head coach of the Chicago Bulls, I brought Michael Jordan in to speak with me. And I said, you know, you've averaged 37, 38, 36 points a game the last three years. You know, you've been the scoring champion. But if you look back at the history of the NBA, there hasn't been a scoring championship for almost 15 years and a champion. A guy that's won the scoring and won the championship, they don't go together. And we need to take the focus off you, which is what teams now t tilt their whole defense towards, stopping Michael Jordan, and open it up for the rest of our team. Brilliant. And it means you taking less shots a game. That's important. But we're going to, and then he stopped me and he said, Are you going to run an equal opportunity offense like <laughs> Tex Winner's been talking about? <laughs> I said, Yeah, I guess you could call it equal opportunity offense, but I'm not going to be calling the plays from the sideline. You guys are going to be reading it on the floor. Yeah. So if the 24 second clock is running down, and it becomes red, which is the call everybody makes when it's under five seconds. We'll teach you the team how to get the ball to you at the end of that clock, because then you can score. He said, well, I don't think that I have to give up a scoring championship. I could score 32 points a game and still win a scoring championship. That's only eight points a quarter. I said, Michael, I had trouble scoring eight points a game when I was a player. <laughs> but... Rather than scoring eight points quarter, why don't you save that fourth quarter and score 14 points in the fourth quarter and take us home? And then you can do what you want to do during the early part of the game and then put the onus and the, the nail in the coffin in the fourth quarter to seal the deal. He kind of liked that idea. And, you know, it was, it was a, I think we lost two or three of our first games that we played as my, first year of coaching and everybody had to kind of figure out how to do it, how to figure out how to play together when the ball was dictating the action, mm -hmm. when the passes were dictating what people would do mm -hmm. rather than a specific number for player being called from this. Mm -hmm. And it gave the team a little bit of authority, which is, you know, exactly what a coach wants to happen. Mm -hmm. I love it. What was your, what was the greatest, Michael Jordan performance that sticks in your head? Well, I used to tell my fellow teammates, companions, and players in the NBA when they'd ask me, what's it like watching Michael Jordan every night? I'd say, you know, we've all had those nights where, you know, you go out, you might, you know, average 10, 12 points a game, and you have a night where you get 24, 25 points. Wow, that's terrific. This guy does it every single night. It's not a night where it's not there. He's on top of his game and at the top of his energy every single night. It's unbounded. And the one of the things that 
stands out when I was even thinking about this topic last night, thinking about our conversation we're going to have today, was that we went on a road trip. I think we used to have two road trips from Chicago to the West Conference. And we play usually like seven games each, maybe one game of Minnesota, which was in the other conference that um, might be a single night, but we play a lot of games in a row through, through a Thanksgiving break, which was when the Shrine Circus was in Chicago. And uh, it would be our circus trip. We got out on the road, we were winning games. Michael played a great game in Sacramento and literally had to be kind of carried not physically carried, but his arm around the shoulder and two of his teammates to get to his room. His back was, yeah, yeah okay. You, you, what do you think about tomorrow? Oh, he'll be back. He'll play tomorrow. Hmm. There's no, there, 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 no way he's going to stop playing. Hmm. He'll want to play just because this is the only chance the fans out here in Golden State or Portland or wherever he was this is the only chance they're going to see him. Hmm. And he knows that. <laughs> and he wants to perform and play the best he can in front of them. And that was a remarkable part about, uh, you know, the effort he gave. And we have effort now from the NBA players where they literally take time off. Mm -hmm. They literally don't plan to take time off. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can play two games in three nights. As basketball players, we used to play. One one of our finishes road trip, we play um, Gold State, Portland, and Sunday in Seattle. Three games in three nights, three in three days. Mm. And now it's literally back to back games. A lot of players take off because they they can't play back to back games, and um, it's. That's a remarkable thing about the performance level of the game that became like Michael Jordan's um, muse mm. was that I need to perform to show these people why I'm the best player in this game or to have my impact on the, the game itself that we're mm. playing. Um, the one time we were on the end of a all-star before the all-star break and we had a game in seattle double overtime game michael bumped a referee and he was uh, suspended for one game the last game of this road trip in phoenix and uh the hue and cry from people that had bought <laughs> tickets from all around the arizona area just so that they could go yeah. watch Michael Jordan. And his only attempt, or only time he played in Phoenix was, you know, let, let the league a little bit embarrassed about, you know, the suspension because it was a minor event, mm. minor thing, accidental, as a matter of fact. So that, that, was, that was perhaps one of the most remarkable things about the effort that Michael put. The idea of how to play with his teammates, mm. how, to, how to engage Dennis Rodman, who was a person that was not uh, a conversationalist, how to engage him and uh, how, to, how to bring him in as a player was something that uh, Michael was able to do that uh, showed leadership the beyond, the, beyond the level that uh, was expected because just three years prior to this, you know, Dennis Rodman was one of the henchmen on the, the, the Detroit Pistons <laughs> team that was taking him down. Yeah, and yeah. their idea was not only to double team him, but to knock him down. Just knock the guy down, make him have to pick himself up off the floor. So, you know, it was a, it was a challenge and they met it, you know, and they adapted extremely well together as, as players. Did you, did you, what was it like, like when you made this decision as an organization, like Dennis Rodman could be the piece that helps us win a championship, but there's a lot of baggage we have to go through here. 
like, was there an assurance? Like, I know our leadership can handle it. I know our culture can handle it. We can take a Dennis on this team that maybe a different team couldn't take on or a different moment the Bulls couldn't have taken on. I mean, I think that's always a challenge as a coach as well. How many Dennis's can you coach at one time before it it just pulls your team apart? No doubt. And you know, the example was San Antonio the year before where, you know, they got in the finals in their conference and Dennis was, uh, you know, reluctant. He, he had to guard Elijah Wan and, you know, David Robinson was the MVP or the defensive player of the year in the NBA. And he didn't want to guard um, Akeem Elijah Wan. Dennis had to guard him and Dennis was like, I don't understand that I'm 230 pounds. I'm giving up 40 pounds to this guy. And, you know, I could take him on for a little bit like we used to do with him and Carl Malone. But, you know, De Dennis had his issues and basically, um, you know, there was, you know, a reluctance to go ahead with Dennis on that San Antonio team. And we traded Will Perdue, uh, for Dennis straight up and you know it was like can we handle him can this guy participate in, in the team in team play and it, he left us no doubt that he was capable but I, I had to make some some adjustments um, there's an NBA rule of the team has to be on the in the court or the building an hour and a half before these games Dennis couldn't focus for that amount of time. He didn't go out and shoot. There, mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't going to perfect his jump shot. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to shoot free throws or dribble a ball. What he did was he'd come and work out. He'd come and ride the bicycle and watch game tape and figure out how the ball was going to bounce off the rim when so-and-so shot. So he could, you could, you know, get a rebound. He took a shower with about 20 minutes left uh, before game time. We started our team meetings at 20 minutes. He'd come out and sit on the sidelines naked with a towel over his head and prepare to get to the, put his clothes on so they could be there. At 13 minutes before the game, the players would be in the hallway, you know, anxious to get out there and warm up before the game and have to come in and get Dennis to go out on the floor with them. And I told the teammates, we're going to find Dennis every single game because he can't be there for an hour and a half or two before a ball game. He could be there one hour. That's what it takes for him to be ready to play the game. So he'll be fined X amount of dollars per minute according to league standards. And we'll just put it together at the end of the year as to what is fines amounted to. We had a basic fine. A dollar a minute was our fine <clears throat> level, which is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. So $30, $30 a game for being 30 minutes late. And that was pretty good. And he ended up um, being the one of the most prepared players, knowing personnel of the other team and knowing knowing what he had to do to get ready for a ball game. And his mind just could take, uh, you know, being there without, you know, with the press coming in and talking to players, he didn't have to deal with that. Mm. He was either on the bike or in the shower getting ready for the game. And mm. I liked that attitude, but I had to give up some of our team rules to make it work. And, you know, it worked really well for us. And you got the so team that, to buy that was, into that idea? Players were all, we had adult players. We had a couple rookies, um, yeah. but we, we had adult players on the team and they all kind of bought into it. This is a unique person and he needs some unique behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. Hmm. Go ahead, Jerry. So just listening to you and uh, I'm kind of like, for that last conversation, I, I kind of tuned in to not what you were saying as much as how you were being. And again, maybe maybe this is some wild ass guess, 
but I, I just felt palpably the love in your voice or the love for your team, the love for your players, whether it was Dennis, Michael, you didn't mention Steve or whoever, uh, Scotty or whoever. And, and so I think we'd be remiss if, if we didn't talk about this, this, this idea of love that I'm feeling from you that's emanating. There's a quote by you that says, loving coaching is the force that ignites the spirit and binds capitalized, binds the team together. What is, can you unpack that a little bit? Because so many coaches out there, they don't want, you know, love, come on. We're not talking romantic love, of course, but I, I can feel your love. It's almost like the way you're being now, if you ask me to lick the floor of the dust to play some ball, I'm yeah. all in. <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> well, you know, I think most of you, it's now uh, they get in the center circle before practice or before, you know, whatever, shoot around and they have a little whatever, come by up. You know, we, we did it as a natural kind of an act. And, you know, we did our basic good morning. And, you know, uh, for your work is our work and our work is God's work. And when we all work together, how happy we'll be. Tex Winter would all of a sudden start singing that little song, that little ditty, and we'd all kind of laugh and join in. And, uh, you know, there, there's just that little community that, that we, we had together. One of the things that I learned from one of my coaches, Johnny Bach, who played basketball for Lombardi at mm -hmm. Fordham. Fordham. Mm -hmm. I'm a Fordham grad, Phil. Did you know Lombardi coached basketball at uh, Fordham? Well, you know what's a funny, funny In story. <laughs> uh, it was was that my my dad was a football player at Fordham. Um, and they were going to bring Lombardi in the next year would have been my dad's coach. And they decided to drop football instead. And he went to the <laughs> Packers and the rest is history. <laughs> so but yeah, I spent many a day in the Lombardi Center. So that's a great, great story. But go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. John told me one story about, you know, Vince and opening the practice that I carried out through my career. Sometimes when I had all veterans, I had a couple teams that were all veterans. I didn't have to, you know, use this, but I put them on the line at the baseline. And which oftentimes I would do after center circle and talk to them or be, be there with them. But I had this thing that Lombardi had said that Johnny Bach remembered. God and the owner of this team, name the team, Bulls or Lakers, has given me the authority to coach you guys. As the coach of this team, and as the one that's got to make decisions for our group, our team, I want you to step across the line to signify that you are part of this act, that you are dedicating yourself to our game and to this authority that I've just explained to you. So a physical act of buying in was what was kind of this idea behind being a coach that I've get, been given this authority. I may not be up to it, but I'm going to do my damnedest to do the job. And um, you guys have to anoint me basically by stepping over the line to signify your participation in this and I, I think that that's something that's kind of unique i don't know anybody else that does that but it's it's kind of an act that i liked physically that people would demonstrate it it didn't mean that there wasn't going to be you know challenges to authority during the course of the year 
but it was a significant act that started off this process of training camp or usually it was you know at the end of all of the cuts when you get down to the the group of guys that you're going to go to battle with and uh you know those things are important the idea that you know when you have whatever smorgasbord uh, whatever's going through the players always get first the you know the, the leaders eat last that's the idea mm -hmm. that you know we in authority who are taking care of you we eat last we get the last of whatever's going on here um so i think that idea that the players are first and foremost in our mind mm. you know that's love that's love that's love we have to sit out and we had situations of uh, Boston, for example, where it's not so hard that they could get our train plane, the wings clear of ice and snow. And we had to go find a hotel, find a hotel room for these players. We'll take the last rooms that are available. You know, we'll be down here in the lobby when you get through. Th that's basically, you know, the concept I think that, that players see that, okay, we're important. We matter. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Love it. And it's demonstrative. It's doesn't have to be spoken or said or, you know, uh, you don't have yeah. to vouch. Yeah. It's it's subsumed in the invitation itself. Make exactly. the assumption, wow, I'm important. Yeah. I'm cared for. And it's empowering. And you said you're probably no one else is doing this, but I can guarantee you after this, that there's going to be a lot more people doing this <laughs> on in any sport. I'm just picturing yeah, the, a, the Rose Hill gym at Fordham. Oh, Rose Hill gym. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've been in there. Yeah. Well, Phil, this has been an amazing chat. We want to be respectful of, of your time and, and thank you so much. And I think that's a, kind of a great place to leave off as well, because I know everyone in, in this room for this conference understands that that love is at, at the core of, of what they do. And it's just so helpful to hear it from people like yourself and Steve and Cindy and everyone who's a part of, of the work that Jerry and I do uh, to give them maybe just like you needed the courage in the 60s to explore something else that this really is the future of coaching. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Jerry. Well, thank you so much, Phil. It's amazing.